Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Lynn Rainville, who is acting dean of Sweet By Our College. And uh, she has her PhD is in Near Eastern Archaeology, uh, but rather interesting, she's spent the past decade or so studying historic African-American cemeteries, segregated schools, conducting oral interviews with descendants of enslaved communities, and also documenting, and this ties into today's talk, monuments around the state that memorialize World War I. She is a member of the Virginia World War I Centennial Committee, and we're thrilled to be speaking on such a timely topic today. Lynn is the author of several books, including Hidden History, African American Cemeteries in Central Virginia, and Virginia in the Great War, Mobilization, Supply, and Combat, 1914 to 1919, the subject of today's lecture. Thank you for being here. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Rainville. Thank you all for coming today. And I also have to thank the Virginia Historical Society. Early on in my research, I received a Mellon Fellowship here to study just upstairs and cull through the amazing collections that are here that document Virginian service in the war, both here and abroad. And I'm very grateful for that fellowship and for the time and expertise of the staff that is here. Um, I highly recommend if you're researching any topic uh, in Virginia. So as Jamie pointed out, my, well, my original background is in Near Eastern archaeology. And then I moved to Virginia in 2001 uh, to teach at Sweet Briar College. And in addition to my Near Eastern research, I had a background in studying American cemeteries. And moving here uh, to the south from Chicago, I had never before considered what enslaved communities did for their burial practices. And one of the first things I did was start researching uh, slave cemeteries. And believe it or not, this is going to get us to World War I in a couple sentences. So I started with uh, the burial grounds of enslaved families, and 10 years passed. And then a colleague of mine who was leading a group of K through 12 teachers to France to study, uh, this was several years ago, to begin studying in uh, World War I in preparation for the centennial. He knew that I knew a lot about graveyards. And I guess for him, if, if it was a 19th century graveyard or a World War I graveyard, they're, they're all kind of the same in terms of cemeteries. So he, when he was looking for someone to help uh, talk to these teachers about what they would be seeing abroad in our American cemeteries in France, he turned to me. Um, and that led me to join the group for several weeks uh, at the Meuse Argonne, one of our deadliest, uh, for America, one of our deadliest battles in World War I. And I spent several weeks studying both our American cemeteries and then uh, because of, the, of course, the concentration, the high mortality in that northeast corner of France, also the cemeteries of uh, the British cemeteries, French cemeteries, Belgian cemeteries, and German cemeteries. And as with any cemetery project, um, as you start to compare gravestones from uh, groups of different ethnicities and cultures, it's not just, you're not just learning about mortuary practices, you're learning about what their values were uh, in their living communities as well. And one of the things that I was surprised to find on this trip, um, I had heard that there was a memorial to one of our segregated units, our American segregated units in France, in the middle of a wheat field. And um, as time has passed, um, I, I should add, by the way, it was damaged in World War II, so that's why this is a damaged memorial. And the memorial was erected, of course, after the end of World War I. And French villagers in this area still maintain and care for this monument. And this started me thinking, seeing a, a memorial to our African American forces in France, I started thinking about Virginia and was pretty certain that we didn't have a single memorial in Virginia to, that was dedicated entirely to one of our units, uh, segregated units. Um, and it also started me thinking about how we memorialize World War I and American service in World War I. Because as any, if any of you have been to France um, along the former front, you'll know that just about every single French village has some memorial to the men and women that they lost in the war. And there are a surprising number of monuments uh, to thank the service of American troops. 
So when I returned to Virginia, I was uh, determined to locate any memorials to World War I here in Virginia. And uh, I got a lead just about immediately from my father-in-law, who lives in Highland County. And um, he said that there was one at the courthouse. Um, anyone who has really sharp eyes uh, in the audience, though, will notice that this is a carbine rifle, a Civil War rifle, mistakenly added to a World War I statue. <laughs> um, and, uh, but with this effort, uh, I mean, it's a very large state, and I was only one person. And I was very fortunate to receive funding from the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and then uh, pair up with a colleague of mine, Dr. Eric Yellen, who teaches at University of Richmond. And together we worked on creating an online database to document the memorials to World War I here in Virginia. And when I first started this project and was telling colleagues about it and, and said that I was looking for World War I statues and memorials, um, some of my uh, colleagues who knew that I was from the North were kind of politely trying to tell me that I, I, it would be much easier if I were looking for Civil War memorials and that maybe I had the wrong war. Um, and, and indeed, as with most of my projects, uh, when I started this, I figured ah, maybe we'd have a dozen, maybe two dozen memorials to World War I. And, and again, this would be one of these projects where you know, I would start in June over the summer, and by the time classes began, I would be done. Um, and not only now is it four years later, um, also it turned out that there are over 250 memorials to World War I in Virginia. And I should specify that I, I was not counting individual gravestones. That would be cheating. Um, and of course, if you count individual gravestones, there are tens of thousands. But just memorial, and by a memorial, some sort of freestanding, a statue, a bridge named in honor of the men and women who sacrificed, uh, a town hall uh, at University of Virginia, we have Memorial Gym, and the memorial in that is from World War I. Um, so all of these different sites I was counting as part of this project. I was very fortunate to work with students from uh, universities across the Commonwealth, not just Sweetbriar, um, especially students at ODU and University of Richmond who helped with this. And some of these memorials are, or to put it another way, if I were teaching a class right now, before I would show this slide, I would ask everyone to draw, if they had to create a memorial to World War I, what might it look like? In other words, to get people thinking about all of the different ways that we uh, think about and symbolically remember a war. Um, and as you can well imagine, if you think in terms of the broad spectrum, something like the Vietnam War Memorial, as opposed to a more traditional memorial to the Civil War. And this was probably what I had in mind when I came back to Virginia and was thinking, what am I looking for? I mean, what might they, how would I even, I mean, without getting up and reading the inscription, how am I going to know, uh, especially if I'm driving by in a car, how would I know that it was a World War I statue? Um, this was a very common, uh, uh, Viscone, the uh, sculptor, designed uh, this mold. And you will see statues like this all over the country. Here in Virginia, we have uh, two or three of these that are remaining. And this was the spirit of the American doughboy. And um, I've been told by people who grew up uh, even in the 1930s that um, this mold was also used for the base of lamps. So some people remember seeing this in, in a, used in a wide variety of ways. Um, and I'm certainly not an art historian. So while I can't give you the uh, fancy theoretical critique of this, um, what I can observe is that um, this individual, which is a remarkably static standing man, if you start to look really carefully what he's doing, or I mean the, the actual spirit of this piece is that he's stepping over barbed wire, he has a grenade in one hand, his rifle in the other, his gas mask at the ready. Um, uh, so it's an interesting composition of, of multitasking. But th that is a rare figural representation. I mean, here in Virginia, only a, a fraction of our uh, World War I memorials are a, a true statue of a soldier. Instead, the more common uh, symbols that are used are um, in the broader genre of war memorials, things like the Egyptian obelisk, which is popular, of course, um, throughout the 19th and part of the 20th century for individual grave markers. And here you have in Greene County, again, on the, the lawn of the courthouse, uh, an obelisk that lists, lists the names of the dead. And I should add that on these war memorials, usually when they list names, it's just the men who did not return. But in some cases, it's in a small enough community, it's everyone who served during the war. And then, of course, the state's official World War I memorial, 
is uh, the Carillon right here in Richmond. And you'll notice in this uh, stunning picture that the gold star in the foreground, and this was added later, the uh, bell tower was erected in 1932, um, and then the gold star represents the gold star mothers, an organization that was found, created in World War I by mothers and wives and daughters um, to honor the memories of their fallen fathers and sons, and then also to work on the repatriation of their remains, which I'll get to a little bit later. Well, one of the more unusual World War I uh, memorials here in Virginia is the aviator, the image on the left. And this stands on the grounds of University of Virginia. And when I moved to Virginia in 01, I, when I first arrived, I was coming to teach at University of Virginia. And honestly, I, I, I don't think I was alone in thinking that this was a monument to Icarus, the Greek myth. Um, uh, and I mean, certainly, if you start looking closely, you'll realize that if it is Icarus, he has uh, World War I era uh, flying boots on, a pilot's helmet, a knife in his belt. Uh, and then if you look really closely at the base, um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful statue sculpted by the same man who sculpted Mount Rushmore. And around the base uh, is a tableau of uh, the, uh, this represents, this is in honor of James Rogers McConnell who was shot down by German fighter planes just a few days before America officially entered the war. And there's this beautiful tableau around the, the base of this of um, dogfighting planes um, and his plane, McConnell's plane, falling to the earth. Um, I should add, though, um, this memorial, James Rogers McConnell, so he had volunteered. I mean, how he was shot down before even America entered. Uh, he had volunteered for the Lafayette Escadrille, as many brave uh, American men did uh, in order to get into the war before we had entered, and also in order to fly what, of course, was at that time a very, very new technology, the aeroplanes. Um, and after he was shot down, President, then President Alderman at University of Virginia um, almost immediately started working on a way to memorialize him. And uh, he started corresponding with the sculptor, but um, he, Alderman never saw the final product um, until it was already in a uh, molded and it was basically too late. And I, I think it's safe to say that President Alderman, when he commissioned a war memorial for a fallen pilot, this is not what he had in mind. <laughs> um, and in fact, you can trace um, the, the correspondence between the president and the sculptor and then the reaction to this memorial originally um, and uh, you know, it, it, it still raises some eyebrows, um, but it, it is an absolutely beautiful, touching memorial to this pilot. And then in sharp contrast, on the right-hand side, um, James Rogers McConnell uh, is, was from North Carolina, and this is the memorial that they erected in his hometown. As I mentioned a moment ago, it's not just about statues um, or bridges. Uh, this is a beautiful Tiffany window that was commissioned down in Washington <laughs> County in Abingdon, um, which has all the different elements. It's hard to, it sits uh, in between a staircase, it's, so it's hard to get the entire, uh, uh, the entire window in a picture. But it is dedicated in part to all of the different armed forces um, and has uh, beautiful elements uh, and different windows in it. And then perhaps a little bit uh, not, not in the same style as a Tiffany window, but a beautiful testament um, to uh, the ingenuity of a small community in Hopewell, which was instrumental in uh, packing munitions and also the uh, community with a large uh, Greek American population. Um, they erected this you know, a very unique arch that contains all these different components, um, and in, in the center, the inscription uh, to the men who lost their lives. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that not only were our armed forces segregated in World War I, but many of the memorials segregated the names of the men who lost their lives as well. So if you look closely on the base of um, uh, using the Jim Crow era terminology, these are the white men who died, and then it reads colored, and then there are two uh, additional names listed for the African-American men who died. Um, and similarly, this is the base of uh, the listening post in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, and that is segregated as well. 
Well, this is usually the moment when I'm speaking uh, in venues, including very small communities across the Commonwealth. This is when, in advance of the talk, I will look into at the particulars of local contributions. And so when you do it here in Richmond, um, it, it doesn't have the same effect, because Richmond, of course, played a huge role in the war. And, and Camp Lee is, is very nearby, and we had base hospitals. And, and then this really ends up being just a partial list. Um, but I include it here just to emphasize that um, for those of you who are either from other parts of Virginia or visit other parts of Virginia, that I can assure you that even speaking in southwestern Virginia or at Danville, Winchester, any part of the state, um, that the local contributions were quite significant and quite varied. Um, and that's, for me, was one of the attractions, or what, for me, that was the importance of writing a book about Virginia's role in World War I. Not that we needed more research into the causes of the war, as complex as they are, um, or the battles, because that, uh, well, first off, that's being done by other individuals, and that's not my own background. But what did matter to me was that not only had, it, in many ways, is it the forgotten war in terms of some of the details of why we went in and how it was fought and how it was won, but at the very local level and from the, the ground up, um, the number of Virginians, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Virginians, in addition to the men who were drafted and then the women who served abroad, that to me was a, a very compelling story and one that had been overlooked uh, in a lot of other places. So in that sense, my talk today is not so much about over there, um, even though, of course, many Virginians served uh, with distinction. For now, I, I will leave the, all, all of the research and studies about what happened abroad uh, on the various fronts and various theaters of war um, to give a quick plug for the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography. Um, in the next upcoming issue, uh, I have an article about one family, one Richmond family's experience in the war. It's the Holiday family, and they sent uh, their two sons, Philip, uh, Percy, and Clayton, um, had very different experiences, um, but both of them worked with uh, cars and with helping uh, supply ammunition in the supply lines to uh, supply ammunition to the front. And they trained nearby at Camp Lee. But instead, I want to focus um, the remainder of my time on the here and now um, and test your eyes for the things that are hidden in plain sight. Um, but that sometimes we overlook, because that's what a lot of my research focuses on, ordinary Virginians doing extraordinary things. And for those of you who have very good eyes, you will realize that this whole time you've been looking at a horse. <laughs> as many of you probably know, well, there are many things happening during the same era as World War I in terms of technological advances. And, and one of them had to do with advances in photography. And then the other thing, which wasn't technological, but it was people power, and that is at training camps across the country, all of a sudden you had concentrations of tens of thousands of young men and women who had a lot of time on their hands. I mean, they were training, but you also had to keep them busy. And if you conflate these two things, um, photographers were uh, doing these living statues, um, organizing people uh, into very precise designs, and their fame, other famous um, images of the Statue of Liberty, um, the, an eagle. Um, they're, they're quite something. And several of these photographs are in the Virginia Historical Society collections. But I want to begin a couple years before America entered the war, back in 1915, because one of the many important roles that Virginia had to play goes back to Virginia's um, strong agricultural and technological uh, history, and not least of which was the railroads and its industry. So starting in 1915, Virginia was supplying um, the Allied forces with steel, wheat, and then horses. And I'll return back to the horses in a moment. And of course, one of the, the, way, one of the reasons why this worked so well is that outside of the port up in New York City, the Hampton Roads uh, area was one of the deepest uh, water ports along the eastern seaboard. And Hampton Roads and the Newport News ended up being one of the two largest points of embarkation for sending troops and supplies abroad, again, both when we were supplying other nations and then when we ourselves entered when we were sending supplies and troops. 
Um, and just to be clear that, um, well, of course, it, there was a lot of ship traffic, and there w we did, we were, of course, working on ship building. There were very few ships for the short duration that we were in the war. Um, very few of the ships that we began building as wartime contracts were finished in time. But instead, much of the function of uh, these docks were for repairs. Um, and then with an extra twist, a story that I'll have to leave for, you'll have to read the book to read more about it, but it's the story of two different German ships that were interred uh, in Newport News and Portsmouth, respectively, and uh, for a long period of time. And the second ship, the Kranz Prince William, uh, Wilhelm was interred for almost two years, and the sailors, the thousand German sailors who were on that ship, uh, were um, held uh, in a nearby, held outside of their ship, and thus they created their own village, um, a little German village outside of their ship until um, the war's end. But Sticking back uh, with other elements of uh, other Virginians and their role, so of course food conservation was critically important, um, and uh, this was of course uh, uh, there are many different aspects to this. Uh, one of which uh, women were encouraged to uh, use particular recipes to save on resources, and you had meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays. Um, and some of these cookbooks encouraging women uh, to use inventive recipes with limited resources are uh, in the VHS uh, archives. I've mentioned horses a couple times, and again, this will come to no surprise as anyone who knows about anything about Virginian history, um, that uh, equestrian culture is very strong. But what you may not know is that Virginia shipped over 400,000 horses and mules to abroad, and mostly to Britain, uh, during the war. And this, again, included the years before we entered the war when we were already shipping horses. And one of the sources for this was the Remont Depot out in Winchester, which is today the Smithsonian Biology and Conservation Institute. Um, and I can tell you right now to plan ahead, because so now as the Conservation Institute, it is usually open one day a year um, for tours. And a couple years ago, the year that I was going to go, there was a hurricane that day, and so you know it was a federal. I forget how they say these things, but you know all federal buildings shut down, including that. Um, so plan ahead and have a plan B in the next year if there's a hurricane. Um, so the Remont uh, Depot uh, was again founded back in the nine years before the war, and it was in part a breeding exercise to try to get the best stock for wartime, of horses and mules for wartime conditions. Um, and here you can see an example down in the lower left-hand corner. So this, again, the railroads tie into this. You have all of these horses being bred and then being shipped on railroad, in railroad cars, shipped out to the port, and then from there being shipped abroad. Now this was such a critical, these horses and mules were so critical for um, the British forces um, in one British handbook that I read, a British uh, general estimated that 70% of the horses that he was using during the war were actually American horses. Um, and so this young man, who grew up just outside of the Remont Mount Depot um, in Winchester, this was a German-American. His father uh, was from Germany and had served in the Union Army in the Civil War. And then Anton Dilger was born in 1884. And he, his background was in medicine. And uh, specifically, he had done research into diseases uh, such as glanders and anthrax. And he is variously credited as being one of the first bioterrorists in this country because, unfortunately, um, his sympathies, although he was an American, um, he became disgusted with the war. And uh, he, uh, in, as the war was going on, but before America got involved, he had himself visited Germany, studied at the University of Heidelberg. And he came back very bitter and angry. And so he crafted a plot to poison some of the mules in these shipment containers. And as you, can, as you probably know about either glanders or anthrax, it's highly contagious. And so he figured that if he could release, he, he was collecting um, samples in vials. And he, he was paying dock workers, mostly in Baltimore, um, to try to basically infect the horse, the mules, right before they were put on the ships. And then, the, uh, because there are such lethal diseases and in such a confined 
uh, space for the travel, traveling across the Atlantic. Um, uh, he thought that this was a very good way to decimate this resource for the Brits. Um, Unfor a wide variety of things happened that, I mean, he was never really all that successful. And um, the, the strange irony of this tale, though, is that so he himself ended up fleeing America when uh, after he had, his attempts had failed and the authorities were looking for him, or certainly trying to figure out who was responsible. And first he went to Mexico, then he ended up in Spain, where in 1918 he died of the Spanish flu. Um, <laughs> And, and this is where I do need to add the misnomer. So although in, very often in newspaper headlines, it was referred to as the Spanish flu, um, it is not because it originated in Spain, just to be clear. <laughs> um, one of the reasons why we use that term is because the Spanish newspapers um, had less restrictions on their press in terms of freedom of press. So one of the first places it was being reported during wartime was in the Spanish newspapers, not that it was actually from Spain. Um, but this is also the moment where I feel like I have to say, because I think we still have two weeks left of flu uh, season, that it's not too late to get your flu shot. So, <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, the plight of German Americans um, during this period, of course, was um, in many cases very difficult. And here in Virginia, we, of course, had a very large German and German American population in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, uh, well, uh, of course, not all Virginians um, were anti-German, and, and before America entered the war, I, I should be clear, uh, many Virginians were not anti-German in the slightest. Um, but after we entered the war and uh, the sense of patriotism overrode other issues, um, there was a, one particular example that caught my attention, this man, George Voigt, um, who's, he was German, but his son was born in America, and his son, in turn, had volunteered for the National Guard, uh, had been in that horrible battle at the Meuse-Argonne, um, and had returned in, the son had returned in 1919 with what today we would call PTSD. Um, and what you're seeing on the upper left is uh, some of George's neighbors here in Virginia um, basically pledging support for him, which of course implies, even though we don't have all the documentation, that he was uh, subject to um, anti-immigrant or anti-German sentiment. Um, so, you know, rather complex um, situation for German Americans. Well, another thing that happened, and this goes back to some of the memorials, this is another beautiful World War I statue, and it was on German Street in Harrisonburg, but you will not find that in a Google search anymore because that street was renamed after the end of the war to Liberty Street. Um, but I do highly recommend, just outside of Harrisonburg, um, it is a, a beautiful statue. And that brings me to something I've alluded to a couple times, which is the role of women in the war. Um, very few of the memorials, I mean, I've just shown two in a row, so that, but that, these are the unusual ones that actually use the imagery of a woman in the World War I memorial. Um, but in terms of what women were doing, I mean, perhaps one of the, the most significant and well-known roles was to serve in the Red Cross. Um, uh, which served a lot of different roles. And one of them, it, it's encapsulated in posters as knit your bit, um, that women were being encouraged uh, to knit. And I must say, when I read this, someone as someone who certainly cannot knit, um, when you start to think through this, and you think about all these women knitting in their homes throughout America, and you realize that it's not like they finished knitting these items, and then someone clicked on Amazon Prime, and then the next day it was over in France. There are some fascinating research when you look into them, well, what, okay, they're knitting. And they were knitting, I mean, here in Richmond alone, um, there's, it's itemized precisely what they knit. Um, the sweaters, the scarves, the socks, the, the gun, uh, gun wipes. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And then it turns out that um, many of these items, because they were knit in such huge quantities, the logistics of ship from going from different communities, you know, let's just say a thousand sweaters, and getting them to any soldier anywhere, including in one of the training camps, let alone abroad, that actually a lot of these items sat in warehouses um, and rotted um, or were subject first to mold or um, moths uh, before they could be sent abroad, um, which doesn't mean you shouldn't be knitting your bit, but just um, package it in plastic. <laughs> 
So, um, but the Red Cross, women served in so many other ways, um, in addition to volunteering in their communities and serving as nurses. And one great example is here in Lynchburg, and this is not a typo. Um, Lynchburg was one of several communities, because of our extensive railroads and our training camps, um, soldiers who were being sent to these training camps or arriving in these training camps would be stopping, and then the trains would be stopping in these communities, and these were very hungry individuals. And so women in these communities, before initially it was before the Red Cross got involved, and women were just volunteering and making huge amounts of sandwiches um, and bringing them to the troops. And in the city of Lynchburg, um, this was so prevalent that um, for a while Lynchburg was known as Lunchburg um, as a reference to, I mean, this is what the soldiers were calling it, and they knew to look forward if they were going to have a stopover in Lynchburg um, that they would be fed. And of course, many of these, not all, but some of these women did end up, even though they were, of course, never supposed to be in directly in the in a battle, um, they were serving uh, along the front and s subject to some of the same uh, misery that the men were, um, including gas attacks, um, and then working with um, our soldiers in a wide variety of capacities. In the case of Richmond, um, Richmond sent uh, money and doctors and nurses to establish, uh, there were many, many base hospitals, but Richmond basically sent the whole package because the, the money, the supplies, um, and this hospital was led by a very famous doctor, Stuart McGuire, um, and uh, he and his wife, his, they married after the war, but uh, uh, Ruth, the, the nurse that um, he appointed to lead uh, the hospital, um, this hospital had one of the lowest death rates uh, in France, and on the left-hand side, I know it's hard to see, but this is a plaque, a memorial, another one of these memorials, uh, to, specifically to the base hospital uh, that hangs in um, one of the, the MCV buildings nearby here. Um, so I promise you, if once you start after this talk, if you are just looking for, keeping your eyes peeled for World War I memorials, you will start seeing them everywhere. Um, and this is another beautiful one. This is Dr. Urban Bass, an African-American doctor, who died on the front while um, several of his men were hit, and he went to take, and he then he himself was hit, but he went to take care of his men first, and then he bled out um, before he could be saved. And this is in his church in uh, Fredericksburg, again, another beautiful window in his honor, um, and then his military grave, uh, gravestone. Uh, if you're interested in um, uh, some of the African-American units, uh, in addition to this wonderful book in the lower left-hand corner, The African-American Doctors of World War I, um, my colleague Dr. Yellen also wrote a book about um, racism in the service of the nation that covers w more than just World War I. Um, and one of the surprising things to me, of course, I had, I had known that our fighting troops were our forces were segregated. Um, but this, this segregation carried into everything from the hospital, the wards within a hospital, um, to the welcome parades when the men returned home. And here you see what was meant to be a temporary memorial. Um, this was erected in Newport News as a victory arch, obviously modeled after, after the Arc de Triomphe. And um, it was so popular that even though it was made out of impermanent materials uh, in the 1960s, as it was I mean, it, it needed to be refreshed. It was then re rebuilt and replaced with a concrete version. So it, it does still stand today, although now it is, it, traffic doesn't pass through it any longer, um, but you can still visit it. And of course, when these men and some of these uh, nurses returned home, uh, they had what today we would call PTSD, but then uh, doctors were just starting to identify as what they called shell shock. And very unfortunately, um, if you read, when you, if you, I mean, with today's um, perspective and you hear the term shell shock, it seems like it could easily be a synonym for PTSD. But unfortunately, when you read what the medical doctors themselves were writing about it, they were basically describing shell shock as weak individuals who had what they would, they would talk about their vasomotors. I don't even know what those are. But they were claiming that people who had shell shock were somehow weak. So clearly they were misunderstanding it so fundamentally. Um, and we know from other sources that the, the men and women who came back with PTSD often suffered for the rest of their lives and, and had um, shortened lives. 
in this particular certificate of death, this was an individual who basically drank himself to death uh, after he returned. More broadly, um, of the uh, 100,000 or so Virginians who were uh, drafted in the war and served in various capacities, um, over 3,600 died uh, directly or soon during the war or soon thereafter. Um, at least five of them are women. Um, and uh, then we have uh, African Americans who were serving. I should add that. Um, most of the African Americans who, who fought in combat were fighting under the French, or with the French, and that for the American troops, um, a lot of the African Americans were serving in labor battalions. And these individuals, of course, had many different duties during the war, but then after the war, the labor battalions were the ones that were given the very grim task to exhume the bodies of Americans from where they fell or from the mass burials during a battle and then reinter them in these newly established American cemeteries. And that's what you see in the background. All of those are individual crosses. They're in this case, these are the temporary wooden crosses, not the final ones that would be crafted out of Italian marble. And this brings me back full circle to our, my own entry into World War I, um, these ABMC cemeteries. The American uh, Battles and Monuments Commission is a federal agency. Um, that has an $80 million a year budget to care for, uh, to originally to have established, and of course now to care for our American cemeteries abroad. And there are several World War I cemeteries. The, the one that's shown here is um, at the Meuse Argonne, um, and then there are several other in that area. These are now the, the, the permanent stones made out of marble. And here you have one of the gold star Gold Star mothers visiting uh, the grave, again, of a, a son or a, her husband. Um, and these were women who petitioned the government after World War I ended. I mean, every nation had to, to answer the fundamental question, which was, where, shall we, where and how shall we bury our dead? And um, you can well imagine being on the other side of the Atlantic from most of these uh, theaters of war. Um, in America, initially, the, the idea was that we would bury everyone not directly where they fell, but somewhere nearby in an, in an American cemetery. Um, but the Gold Star mothers argued that they should be given the choice whether or not to bring their family members back either to Arlington or for burial in a family cemetery. And um, they eventually uh, crafted an agreement that not only could they choose where to bury their dead, but that if they decided to bury abroad, that on the government's dime, they would get a one-time visit uh, to the site of that grave. And that's what you see here, uh, a mother visiting the grave of uh, her child or a wife of a husband. I should add that Arlington, um, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, um, the, the soldier from World War I who is buried here uh, was a soldier who fell at the Meuse Argonne. Um, and that is, of course, the, the iconic memorial to the dead who were not identified. But to leave you with something, uh, again, something that you would find in all of your communities as you leave uh, after this lecture, which would be uh, community gravestones and cemeteries, um, if, if you're lucky, you have a stone that's on the left, because that is going to be easy to find. Um, this is a remarkable statue for Russell Snyder uh, in Augusta County. Um, but what is far more likely is that you'll have to look a little bit more carefully. Um, so on the right-hand side, this is a small metal, a metal marker provided by a funeral home. Um, and this is an African-American man named Fountain Green. Um, and in this case, I mean, uh, I, there's no way that I would have known he was a World War I soldier. It, it's the opposite. I went looking for, I had read um, some of his, about some of his service and then went looking for his memorial. Um, and it was extremely hard to find. But when I did find it, you'll notice that someone had left flowers. I mean, they're, they're plastic flowers, so they've probably been there for a while. Um, but for me, the, the importance, the, this story is so important, how Virginians um, worked together to support individuals here at home and abroad during the war, um, that it's very important to me that, that we keep the memories alive. And there are some very creative ways that individuals are doing this across the Commonwealth. Um, and one of them is back down in Washington County. This is in Abingdon. 
I'm sure many of you have heard that communities do spirit walks or something around in October in their cemeteries. Um, and in this particular, actually, and just to be clear though, although many communities do it around Halloween, uh, Abingdon is always a little bit different and they do it in August, but either way, it's still a spirit walk. And um, in this instance, the grave is um, that of Herbert Hagee, um, who died during the war. And then the individual in the white suit, this is a high school student who was then um, embodying the spirit of Mr. Hagee uh, for the spirit walk and, and telling his story. And that to me um, is where I will leave it in telling the stories of all of these various Virginians. And I encourage any of you who have stories to tell, I, I hope, VHS isn't going to hate me for this, but um, to d consider donating um, letters, pictures, um, artifacts. Everywhere I've been speaking now in World War One in Virginia for roughly four years, and every time I give a talk, um, there's always someone who comes up to me afterwards with just a compelling story of a father, a grandparent, a relative from Virginia, and often they have some of the material culture or, or some part of that memory. Um, which is so very important to preserve. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. And we do have a microphone um, if you have a question so that everyone can hear you. These are, the, I, these are the questions I like, the quiet ones. Andy? The Battle of Verdun, and no Americans participated in it right. other than the uh, flying squadrons, the Espadrille, Lafayette. But there's an ossuary there, mm -hmm. and I yes. find it very interesting that the combatants are interred together. I think over 12,000. Oh, well, I think it's more than 12,000, although I, that I can't tell you off the top of my head. But I have visited that site. And um, so the, what, one of the things you're looking at is the difference between European uh, mortuary rituals and American. So uh, as I'm sure many of you know, in, in Paris, I mean, in many other parts of Europe, the idea of an ossuary where you, you do, I mean, now you're combining different, um, different individuals, but actually the bones themselves. That, that is something that you know we don't usually do in this country. Um, but is in Paris, there are six million people in an ossuary, you know, below the the, the uh, streets. Um, so I, for me, th that is just part of. It, it's not just about World War One or even the fact that they died in battle. It's just a very different um, mortuary tradition um, that here I think would raise a lot more eyebrows for if you did it for any reason. <laughs> um, because keep in mind, in Europe, in many European countries, even in their regular graveyards, you don't own that plot forever. You own it for a period of time, and then they will exhume the bodies after you know, the flesh has rotted. Um, and then they will compress the bones to make room for someone else. And again, but in this country, normally that, that would be called um, something along the lines of grave robbing. So it, it's just different, different cultural um, attitudes towards death. Uh, my grandfather was in Muse Argonne and uh, was received the uh, horrible uh, gassing of mustard gas. He made it home, but he drank himself to death. Uh, but I've had his uniform and his his steel pot and all of that for almost fifty years, and I've always been curious as to why I had the steel pot. Did all the soldiers keep their pots back then when they when they were discharged? You had any idea? In fact, I think it's the opposite. And I am going to call on you, Al. I see you right there. Um, I, I believe they were, they were supposed to give it back, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I not to say anything about your grandfather. I'm, uh, You're close, Lynn. Uh, is actually an austerity measure by the army. Uh, the war ended with four million guys in uniform, two million here and two million in France. And we got all these helmets, and we know we're going to get small again. So they said, rather than turn in all these helmets and gas masks, if you served overseas, you keep that as a souvenir of your service, oh. along with a full set of uniforms. All right, better answer. See, this is why I called on Al. 
Uh, but, I, but as an aside, so, so I'm an archaeologist by training, so I, I will just say that, um, however, if, even if you're in a, on a, um, like one of our training uh, at camp, at what today is Fort Lee, what used to be Camp Lee, and so therefore one of the former um, training fields here in this country or in France, um, that any artifact that you find is an antiquity and that you um, should leave it where you find it and not take it home. <laughs> so. I just want to recognize my wife whose father was in World War I. World War I. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Rangel, first off, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. I wonder if in your research, especially prior to taking up this project, you had gotten a sense of the full economic impact of the Great War on Virginia's lagging economy. You know, there's a lot of, if you read their old newspapers, you talk about the New South and this and that. And yet, you know, Virginia was way behind the rest of the country as far as um, population growth and, and economic growth. You know, you get the uh, factory down in Hopewell uh, making gun cotton for the British Army because they needed the help. 1916, New York Times sends a reporter down. He writes an article, Hopewell, the toughest town north of hell. You know, uh, it, it, was, it was a rough time, but it was amazing. Did you get a sense of the important importance of this economic boom even before we sent the first troop over there. Yeah, and that's exactly why, as I, I uh, in starting off these talks, that I often start with 1915, not 1917. Uh, the, um, to put it another way, and, and I, am, I, I don't have enough background to be able to say conclusively if it was maybe one of the most important um, economic events in the 20th century for Virginia, but it must be close because I'll leave you with one example, which is that today we have a four or five billion dollar shipping industry in Hampton Roads. And that begins back, well, it begins in the 19th century with a dry dock company that scouts out that spot. But it would have always remained, or it, it's hard to imagine that it would have grown into what it is today if it, there hadn't been that catalyst of, um, especially the repairing of the ships. And then, again, many of these contracts began, I mean, they didn't, the contracts, the ships weren't finished until after the war ended. And so it set in motion this new cycle of shipbuilding and having this port and having all the infrastructure. I, I, I mean, really, I would say it was, it was almost like night and day before World War I in terms of a lot, in, in, we also had um, uh, Langley Field. I mean, Virginia ends up being part of uh, um, a tremendous amount of critical technological advances during the war, and then industries that set a precedent for many, many decades to come. I was just wondering if uh, someone wanted more information about Camp Lee, what would be the best source to go to? Al. <laughs> uh, um, well, Camp, so Camp Lee, now Fort Lee, uh, which of course then itself, because it was founded 100 years ago, is just celebrated its centennial. There's a lot of um, documentation and articles um, about uh, Camp Lee. And they have two museums on base. Um, so that, but, but truly, I would, there, there are several people in the audience afterwards that would um, probably be able to cite the art, you know, articles by name. Uh, what information did you uh, come up with on uh, aviators from Virginia in World War One? The kind of the, the glorified, uh, at least in my growing up, <laughs> stories of the, the biplanes and the sop with camels and all that. Mm -hmm. Any particular ones? Well, uh, the one that uh, is always first in my mind is James Rogers McConnell, but we also, there were dozens of men um, from VMI, um, from several of our uh, military schools who, again, were, they were volunteering for uh, mostly the French forces um, long before we got involved. And um, I, I guess um, the best answer I can give is that James Rogers McConnell's diary is online if you, um, because UVA did a wonderful exhibit about his service. 
Um, actually, several of the men kept diaries, sadly, because their death rates were so high. I mean, I, it's that sense of you know having the, your last letter in your, with you. Um, several of these men wrote very compelling diaries. But because I've read McConnell's, um, as he talks about their training and um, how early on it was just as likely when they, to put it this way, um, as they were training, initially they were not provided with parachutes because there was just no sense that that would, ever, that would help you. Um, the, and um, McConnell, as he, as he goes through his training before he dies, He's talking, I mean, many of his friends predecease him, I, I guess. I, and I never did the statistics on, on the mortality rate just within his own unit, but it was enough that in his own you know, diary over the course of a year, it's, it's multiple people that he's talking about you know, have gone down. And, and I should add that when he was shot down, uh, he, he fell right behind what was at that moment behind the German lines. And so it took a while. Um, they had a temporary memorial where he fell. And then um, they uh, added to it over time, and then eventually moved his body later. I mean, I mean, they're absolutely compelling stories. Um. Oh, hey, Beth. Hey, I I just wanted to mention. Um, I know people are curious about the Carillon. Yes, please. It, it is being restored by the Commonwealth of Virginia right now, and that's why you see the construction fence. Um, the goal is to have it open for Armistice Day, so mark your calendars, and you all know the 11th month, the 11th day. Um, so that would be a wonderful time to go out and visit the Carillon. Phase two comes afterwards where they're going to be restoring the bells. Graham? Uh, I just wanted to mention, if you're looking for other World War I plaques, mm -hmm. uh, the Knights of Columbus uh, Council, 395, is on Pump Road. Oh. And they have a, a plaque that somehow talk about the Forgotten War when they were building a new building. They just threw it out in the yard. Oh. And uh, it was luckily found by two members. And they had it restored, and it lists like 300, I can't remember the exact numbers, 382 men of that council. Nobody even realized that many Catholics were in the, <laughs> men were in Virginia at the time. And uh, of that 382, I think 18 were deceased, so they put them at the top. And then they have this, so it's there uh, on Pump Road, 2324 Pump Road, in their, uh, in their thing, so it's a, Nice little, we had a nice little celebration last year to uh, restore it. And uh, luckily for us, uh, Tony Grapponi from Grapponi, uh, I don't know, is it Stoneworks or whatever it's called, uh, he restored it because it's a beautiful bronze plaque. So go, go by and see it. <laughs> thank, no, thank you. you. And yes, I should sir. mention that the DAR has also been um, in various parts of the Commonwealth restoring World War I memorials. And in Lynchburg, not the one that you saw, not the, not the listening post, but um, there was another memorial to World War I that the local DAR just finished restoring. So um, I guess the Forgotten War can be forgotten for 99 years, but on the centennial, people remember the Forgotten War. Lynn, we have one more question here. Yeah. Hi, I just want to make a couple quick comments. First, Base Hospital 45, Dr. Stuart McGuire, in World War II was replaced by the 45th General Hospital. All physicians, most of the physicians from Richmond, which was very successful. Uh, unfortunately, in World War II, the experience of the American Red Cross was not as good. And at the end of World War II, the American Red Cross was not permitted to supply blood to any Virginia Richmond hospital because of their profiteering in World War I. Also, it's interesting when you talk about the economic boom to Virginia in 1915, remember it was only 60 years earlier that a invading army used a scorched <laughs> earth policy. Thanks. And see, we always come back to the Civil War. So. With that, I thank you very much.